So I read a really scary book. It's called The Mustache. It came out in 1986 and it was written by a Frenchman called Emmanuel Carrère. Sorry, French people. I originally mostly went into this book for the novelty aspect of it. Uh, as you'll come to find out, the story setup is pretty uh, interesting. Uh, but what I didn't expect was that once I was done with it and I put it down, that I'd have to mark it down as one of the most dreadful and terrifying horror experiences that I've ever had. So in this video, I'm essentially going to be retelling that story in a very summarized fashion. I'll be hitting most of the major story beats, but I'll be skipping over a lot, obviously, especially all of the inner monologue, which is basically what makes this book so fascinating and scary. So if you really want to have that full, dreadful horror experience that I mentioned before, then I really recommend that you actually go pick up the book and read it for yourself. It's not that long and it's available in pretty much every bookstore I'd have to imagine. Before we begin, you need to know just a couple of things. Number one, the main character character is never named in the book, so for this video's sake I have decided to call him Jeff. And he also uses my likeness. Two, I will be retelling this book in my own words, but every now and then I'll quote little bits and pieces of the book and when I do it'll be displayed in text on screen along with the page number. Three, the story is a bit of a slow burn, uh, so I, you know, I obviously think that it's worth it otherwise I wouldn't have made this video but thought I'd let you know that up front in case you're all TikTok damaged and four this video took me dummy long to make because for some reason I thought I would just animate a whole book by myself so uh, it's pretty janky at times and some of that is you know on purpose and some of it isn't but please cut me some slack in that regard I didn't want to spend another month on this thing so it is what it is and that should be everything you need to know I'll be back at the end of the video to share some thoughts but for now it is my great pleasure to tell you about the mustache Chapter 1 Our main character Jeff is standing in the bathroom shaving his beard, not touching his mustache. He's had this mustache for several years at this point. In fact, he's had it for so long that his wife, Agnes, has never seen him without it. As he's standing there in front of the mirror, he cracks a little joke and says, Hey, what if I shaved off my mustache? Agnes replies, Yeah, what if you did? Maybe you should. Really? She laughs. Uh, no, no. I prefer you with a mustache. But I'm gonna head to the store real quick. Don't forget that we have to leave in about 30 minutes. So get ready and I'll be back in a few. Agnes leaves the apartment and Jeff is now alone in the bathroom. He looks at himself and he thinks, You know what? <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna shave my mustache. And so he does. He takes the razor and he starts shaving off his mustache. And he pretty much does this as like a prank on Agnes almost. Like I said, she's never seen him without a mustache. So he's pretty much thinking that it'll be funny to see her reaction when she gets back home. So then he goes out in the living room to wait for her. While he's waiting though, for some reason he gets super anxious about the whole thing. But yeah, he sits down on the couch until he hears the door unlock. Agnes comes back into the apartment and almost by reflex, Jeff immediately turns down towards his shoes. Agnes comes into the room, walks up to the record player and turns on a record and asks him what he's doing. What are you Jeff doing? lies and says, uh, just tying my shoelaces, uh, they broke. He then gets up from the couch and leaves the room, still having not faced Agnes head on, and he walks into the bedroom. Once there, he opens the wardrobe, looks at his other pairs of shoes, and then he takes a deep breath. He forced a smile, surprised to find he could even manage it. Shut the closet door, jamming it with a piece of cardboard that kept it from swinging open, and returned to the living room, his neck a bit stiff, his face unprotected and smiling. Agnes had turned off the stereo and was putting the record back into its sleeve. We should probably get going now, she said, turning toward him before gently lowering the cover of the turntable. The red light went out, although he couldn't recall having seen her push the button. So they head on out of the apartment because they are going to their friend's place, Serge and Veronique, to have dinner. 
However, the fact that Agnes didn't acknowledge the fact that he had shaved off his mustache is really eating away at Jeff. At this point, he doesn't really understand why she didn't acknowledge it, and this is making him almost annoyed with her. So as they're driving towards Surgeon Veronique's, Jeff is visibly agitated. He's kind of hitting the steering wheel, shouting at traffic, just overall being kind of annoyed. But after a while, they do arrive, and Agnes gets out of the car to go up to Surgeon Veronique's apartment while Jeff finds a parking spot. As he's circling around, he's still thinking about why she didn't say anything and why she's playing this game with him and that's when he realizes that that's exactly what this is. This is a game to her. Yeah, she saw that he had shaved his mustache and she decided to pull kind of a reverse prank on him by not saying anything. In fact, she did it so well that he didn't even notice and now he's playing directly into it by being annoyed with her. This is followed by another realization this is why she left the car before me. She's going up to search and Veronique to tell them to not react to me not having a mustache. He goes from annoyed to impressed very quickly, but then thinks, okay, I see you, Agnes, but I won't play your game. In fact, I'm gonna do you one better. Once I get up there and search and Veronique don't react to me not having a mustache, I'm not gonna react to them not reacting. I'm also just gonna play it cool all evening. That way, at the end of the night, when everything's revealed, I'll be the winner. He parks his car, gets inside of the apartment, and he has to admit Serge and Veronique are in remarkable form. They don't bat an eye. At one point, he even ends up alone in the kitchen with Veronique. He knows that Veronique doesn't have this sort of wit that Agnes has, so she'll definitely break under the pressure. He looks at Veronique trying to provoke a reaction and says, Hey, Veronique, can I just say, you look great lately. She turns to him. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Same to you. Have you been working out or something lately because you're looking really energized? Impressed by how she got out of that one, he's about to say something more, but now it's time for dinner, so they all sit down at the dinner table. During dinner, conversation floats pretty much normally. They talk about movies, politics, anything that they would talk about on any other night. But as time goes on, this tension starts wearing on Jeff. Despite the implicit tension that this impeccably crafted joke produced as the evening wore on, he felt sad. Like a child who, during a family dinner held in honor of his prize for an outstanding achievement, wants the conversation to center only on this and suffers because once he has been congratulated, the adults don't constantly refer back to it but speak of other things. As the evening goes on, it's now getting late. Serge and Veronique start bickering with each other. This is something they're kind of known to do on nights like this, especially after a few glasses of wine. Jeff can feel himself get annoyed again because at this point, they've all just taken this too far. And this is cemented even further when just 15 minutes later, Jeff and Agnes are in the door thanking Serge and Veronique for a lovely evening, saying the dinner was dinner great, great and let's, let's do it again soon. soon. Then they walk out of the apartment, into their car and drive back home. During the drive, Jeff is thinking to himself, why doesn't she just acknowledge it? She could say something right now and it wouldn't even have to be a big deal. She could just go like, hey, it doesn't actually look that bad and that'd be it. It doesn't have to be a big deal. And then they'd be done with it, but she's really taking it too far. He looks over at her in the passenger seat and he's suddenly struck with her beauty. He's reminded that she does have a tendency to pull these sorts of pranks on other people every now and then, and that her wits is one of the reasons he loves her as much as he does. Red light, the car stops. Okay, he thinks. He leans in next to her. You won, he whispers. He gives her a kiss on the side of her head. It looks different, doesn't it? He tenderly whispers in her ear. Green light. They sit in silence, but after a couple of minutes, she asks, What looks different? <sighs> Give me a break. What do you mean? Please. What? Okay, joke's over. Joke? What joke? He gets annoyed again. That's enough, Agnes. That's enough of what? You know what? Stop the car. Stop the car right now. He pulls into the bus lane and stops the car. Agnes turns to him. What's wrong? Why are you annoyed with me? Stop. No, what is it? He can feel himself getting annoyed again. She wants me to say it? To like make a fool out of myself? Nothing. No, don't do that. Tell me what's going on. He sighs. Come on, my mustache? Your mustache? 
Angrily, he grabs her hand and puts her fingers on his upper lip. But just as he's about to say something, a bus rolls up behind them, and he is in the bus lane, so he starts the car and they keep driving. Another couple of minutes of silence later, Agnes speaks up again. So you want to grow a mustache? Again, he grabs her hand and puts it on his lip. No, I shaved it. Honey, I think you're taking this joke a little too far. Yeah, your specialty, right? For the rest of the drive, they sit in silence. They get out of the car in silence, walk into their apartment in silence, get undressed in silence, and get into bed. Laying in their bed, Agnes finally speaks up, saying, Hey, I think Serge and Veronique have made up by now. I think we should too. Jeff agrees, this is silly. They embrace in the dark. After a few minutes, he asks, You awake? Yeah. What are you thinking about? <laughs> Your mustache, of course. Silence in the room. In the car, you scared me a little bit. You were close to taking it too far. No, Agnes, you were close to taking it too far. What do you mean? You're the one who can't let this joke go. Let what joke go? You're scaring me. Stop. I need you to stop. You want me to stop? Why don't you stop? This is insane. You told Serge and Veronique to pretend not to notice anything. What are you talking about? Are you hearing yourself? The fight continues until Agnes finally says, Why don't we call Serge and Veronique? He agrees with her, takes out their phone, punches in the number, lifts the handset to his ear. Hello? Hey, Veronique, it's, uh, it's Jeff. Oh, hey Jeff, what's going on, what's up? Yeah, so uh, I just have a question. Did you get a good look at me tonight? What? Yeah, like tonight, did you get a good look at me? Yeah? Okay, yeah, uh, did, did you notice anything different? I don't know, why? Did you notice that I've shaved my mustache? Your mustache? What are you talking about? Agnes takes over the handset. Hey, Veronique, listen. If I told you to lie and that this was some sort of prank, can you promise me that you would drop the act, please? Have I asked you to lie about Jeff having a mustache? She waves Jeff over to the handset so he can hear as well. No, you haven't, obviously. And I don't know if this is another prank or what, but we're trying to sleep over here, okay? So... Have a good night. Jeff and Agnes looks at each other for a couple of seconds, but Jeff then gets up. Okay, what about photos? Like the vacation photos from Indonesia, for example. He walks over to a drawer and pulls out the photo albums, flips through them and takes out a couple of photos of himself. Yeah, there he is, he does have a mustache on him, so he takes them and he hands them over to Agnes. She looks down at them, sighs and looks up at him. What are you trying to prove? He stares at her in disbelief of her stubbornness, then he sighs. Okay. Let's just go to sleep. She agrees, and they lay down in bed, back to back. They don't touch. Before he falls asleep, he feels her hand slightly graze his. He strokes the back of her hand with his fingertips, and he remembers anecdote after anecdote about how she would prank their friends, coming up with one outrageous lie after the other. He smiles for himself in the dark. Very funny, Agnes. He thinks, very funny. Chapter 2 The next morning, Jeff wakes up exhausted. He gets dressed and goes into work. He works as an architect together with two colleagues, Jerome and Samira. At work, he's having a hard time staying focused, to the point where Jerome notices and asks, Hey, Jeff, are you doing alright over there? Are you, are you good? Jeff hesitates. Uh, it's, uh... No, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. It's fine. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just a bit tired. He sits for a little while longer, but then decides to go out for a little bit. He leaves the office and goes down to a corner store where he picks up a pack of cigarettes, even though he's technically quit. Did Jerome and Samira not say anything? They didn't. He was so tired, so preoccupied with thinking about last night that he hardly noticed, but they didn't say anything about his mustache. Perplexed, he goes back into the office, this time making sure to look both Jerome and Samira right in the eye, but they just nod to him as he comes back, and then they continue working like normal. He sits there for a while, but then has a realization. Agnes was taking this really far last night. 
How far is she willing to take this? I mean, she told Serge and Veronique at home in the evening, she was like crying and she didn't break character. What if she called Jerome and Samira and told them the same thing that she told Serge and Veronique? Again, he's overtaken with the sort of pride where he doesn't want to lose here, but he has to ask. So he says, uh, guys, was that? So did Agnes call any of you? They look at each other and shake their heads and then back at Jeff. No. Why? Uh, no reason. Later that night, Jeff comes home and he finds Agnes in the living room watching a movie. He sits down next to her and watches alongside her. They do not talk. When the movie's over, she gets up from the couch and says, I'm going to bed. Yeah, okay. She goes into the bedroom and closes the door. He, however, cannot relax. He paces back and forth through the apartment and then has an idea. He leaves the apartment and goes out on the sidewalk. Luckily, the garbage truck doesn't come until tomorrow morning, so the trash is still here. He starts ripping the bags open, spreading garbage all across the sidewalk, just searching, rummaging, looking for something, any sign. And there it is his mustache clippings. He gathers them up in his hand and triumphantly walks back into the apartment. He opens the bedroom door, awakens Agnes and holds his hand out. So what's this? What? Yeah, what's this? I don't know. Hair? Mm Mm-hmm. What hair? She realizes now what he's talking about. In disbelief, she looks at his hand and then up at him your mustache hair? Yes, it is. I don't know what you think this proves, Jeff. He looks at her in disbelief, says, Okay, fuck it. Turns around and walks out of the bedroom, slamming the door shut. She knows it's bothering me at this point. She knows it's not funny anymore. It doesn't matter what kind of payoff she's planning for this whole thing. It's not okay. It's not fine. It's bothering me and she's not backing down. He undresses and lays down on the couch. His annoyance turns to sadness, and he feels utterly alone. He cannot sleep, and in the middle of the night, he hears the familiar sound of the floorboards creaking as Agnes comes out to join him on the couch. They make love to each other, and afterwards, they hold each other, speaking tenderly, both ensuring one another that they're not joking, they're not pulling some kind of prank, both thinking that the other one is the one taking it too far, both in this moment realizing that both of them are being serious. But what does it mean? Has she gone mad? Has he gone mad? I'll go see a psychiatrist, she said. Why you? If someone is nuts, it's me, he replied. It's me. Why? Because everyone else thinks the same thing. They also believe I've never had a mustache, so I'm the one who's deranged. We'll both go, she said, giving him a kiss. Maybe it's just something that happens all the time. You think so? No, neither do I. I love you. And they kept on repeating that they loved each other, believed each other, trusted each other, even if it was impossible. What else could one say? Chapter 3 Jeff and Agnes have coffee together for breakfast. Agnes says that she's going to be looking into getting in contact with a therapist, and he agrees. He then leaves to go to work. On his way there, he's thinking about last night, and he comes to the conclusion that he still thinks that Agnes must be pranking him. Despite the intimate moment they had last night, he simply cannot see another explanation. At work, he again has a hard time concentrating and decides to go for a walk. As he's aimlessly wandering around, he decides that he needs to have an objective outside opinion on this whole thing. But where would he get it? He walks by a church and considers going inside and asking a priest, but he's never been a man of faith. As he's about to cross a street, he sees a man on the other side, holding a cane with sunglasses on. The man is blind. Jeff gets an idea. 
He gets his sunglasses out of his bag and puts them on, despite it being an overcast day, and then he starts walking, looking for the perfect participant. Soon he sees a woman with a baby stroller and he walks up to her. I excuse me? Hmm? Hey, hey ma'am, sorry. Uh, do you have a second? Oh, uh, sure. How can I help you? Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, so this is a little silly, but as you can see, I'm blind. And the thing is, I found an ID, and I'm not sure if it might belong to my friend who I was hanging out with earlier, or if it's some random person and I should take it to the police. Would you mind taking a look at it and just telling me the name on there? Oh, yeah, sure, of course, yeah. He hands her his ID. She looks at it for a second and then gives off a little laugh. Uh, well, um, no, there's a, there's a mistake here. This is, this is you in the picture. Oh, how silly. That's me in the picture? Yeah, it sure is. You're positive? Yeah, absolutely. This, this is you. Yeah? He almost panics a little bit. He didn't think this far ahead. How will he get her to say what he wants to hear? Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, so the man in the picture has a mustache? Of course. There it is. How did she recognize him then? Well, <laughs> I don't have one. Yes, you do. She says and hands over the ID and keeps walking. He stands there at a loss for words. Wait, did she mean that he has one in the photo? Did she mean now? He looks up, but she's already gone far down the street and it's too late to ask follow-up questions now. Frustrated, he keeps walking. Well, she did say that I do have a mustache. And that means that... Yeah, that means that Agnes is the one who's crazy. He considers this for a little while and is struck by sadness over the realization that his wife is in fact having some sort of episode. He saw now that last night had been her desperate call for help. In a state of confusion, she'd understood her condition. When she'd mentioned a psychiatrist, it was to oblige him to take her there. Caught in the net of madness, she was struggling, trying to make him comprehend. He gets back to the office and tries to continue working, but he's occupied by the thought of his sick wife. There's a work project with a deadline coming up, so Jerome is giving him some shit for again and again leaving the office when they need to work. Jeff tells Jerome that, unfortunately, he needs to go home for the day. Jerome began to protest. Shit, this is no time for that. But he cut him off sharply. I suppose, he said, that you realize Agnes hasn't been feeling well, so listen to me. I don't give a fuck about the gymnasium. I don't give a fuck about the office. I don't give a fuck about you, and I intend to take care of her. Got that? He leaves to go home to tend for his wife. Once home, he decides to treat her by taking her out to a nice restaurant. The dinner is nice, they're enjoying themselves, but throughout the whole thing, he can sense that she now understands that he understands how sick she actually is. Yet he could hardly eat. His throat was tight from the way they interacted. Their tender, easy manner suggested to him the spectacle of a couple putting on a brave front. The woman knows that she's doomed and that the man she loves knows it too and is intent on not letting anything show ever. Not even at night, awake in his arms, certain that he too is not asleep and that, like her, he's struggling to fight back tears. And just as such a woman would make it a point of honor to prove that the word cancer didn't frighten her, Agnes, as she stroked his cheek, then his upper lip, murmured, it's going back, isn't it? As they're finishing up dinner and it's time to pay, he takes out his wallet to place his credit card on the table. As she does, she gets a glimpse of his ID card and asks to see Can it. Can I see it? He hesitates for a second, but then obliges and gives her the ID. She looks at it, smirks a little bit, and then looks back at him. <laughs> Good try. I see that it's magic marker. Now that everything about her illness is out in the open, he's not sure how to deal with the situation. Does he argue against her? Does he play into her delusion? But before he has time to say anything, he can see that she is rubbing her finger along his mustache on the photo. You've got it on there pretty good as well. She opens her purse and takes out a razor blade. And with it, she scrapes off the mustache off of his face in the tiny black and white photo on his ID. 
She'd scratched off his mustache from the surface of the picture. Also a bit of his nose, a strip of his mouth, and, of course, it didn't prove a thing about the face in the picture before it had been mutilated. For a second he's shocked and taken aback, but then he grabs a hold of himself and thinks, She is sick. I can't blame her for how irrational she's acting. They come home, and haunted by the experience of her scratching up his ID card, he has another thought. What if she's destroyed all pictures of him with a mustache? He thinks about the photos from Indonesia that they brought out the other night. He calmly asks her, Hey, where did we put the photos from Indonesia? Sorry? Yeah, the photos from Indonesia. Where did we put them the other night? Indonesia? My love, we've never been to Indonesia. He doesn't respond. He sees that she has tears in her eyes, and then she says that I'd prefer to sleep on my own, I think. She goes into the bedroom and closes the door. Jeff stays up, feeling an intense sadness for his wife and her delusions. He wants to help her, he'd do anything to help her. She might be crazy, she might be going through something, but he loves her. In his head, he can't help but imagining a dark future of her being locked up in some asylum and him visiting her as often as he can until he gradually stops. He forces himself to push the thought away and he goes to sleep on the couch. You've made it uh, halfway through the story. Uh, it only gets better from here. It's a bit of a slow burn, but you know, that's, I, I didn't write the story. I'm just retelling it. I just wanted to remind you to, to, to read the book. It's available on Amazon. Uh, and also to check out my hey, Patreon. I would love if you did that. Um, but at the least, if you could so uh, subscribe, I'd love that. I feel like I'm bad at reminding people to do that. And, and, uh, and, and it shows uh, <laughs> on my numbers. So, hey, if you don't mind subscribing, do that shit. That'd be super Hello. cool. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that's everything. Uh, hope you're having a good day. Let's continue with the story. Damn, there's like so many ants here. So, so many ants. Chapter four. Jeff wakes up from an unrestful sleep in which he just had a dream where he was wondering if it's pronounced mustache or mustache. He looks around and realizes that he was awoken by the phone calling. He picks up and it's Jerome. Hey, uh, what the fuck was that about yesterday? And did you say something was wrong with Agnes? Hey, Jerome. Yeah, I'm happy you called. I was actually gonna reach out to you because you know some therapists, right? Yeah, I know a couple of them. Why? What's going on? So, Agnes is not doing very well. Way. Well, she's having some delusions. For one, she doesn't think that I ever had a mustache. Silence on the other end of the line. Excuse me? Yeah, she, she, she says that she can't remember that I ever had a mustache. I don't think I've ever seen you with a mustache. Jeff sits down. Did Agnes put you up to this? No, I haven't talked to Agnes. Jeff, are you okay? At this point, Agnes enters the room. Is that Jerome? Jeff nods. Agnes takes over the phone. Hey, Jerome. Do you have any good contact information for a good therapist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agnes writes down a name and a number to a therapist called Sylvain Kalenka. She hangs up the phone and he looks at her. Am I the crazy one? Agnes sits down. Yeah, uh, I think it might be you, baby. It's not me. Where are the photos from Indonesia? We've never been to Indonesia. So, but so, so where did we buy this Indonesian blanket then? We didn't. Our friend Michael bought that for us. He hesitates, and then he gets up. Okay, uh, other photos. There, there must be other photos, right? Agnes sighs, but helps him bring out all the photos that they have. Vacations, visiting Agnes' parents, late nights with friends. As he's going through them, in each and every one of them, he is wearing his mustache. He takes a particularly clear one and holds it out to her. So what you're telling me is that I don't have a mustache here. You don't. In none of these. In none of them. He sits down on the couch. It was, in fact, clear. 
all he could do now was be treated. And in one sense he understood that she'd hidden the photos to avoid the danger of his opening fresh wounds. In her position... But only the night before he'd been in her position, certain that she was the one who was sick, not him, and during all this time, even now, she still clung to exactly the same arguments. He's crazy, but I love him. I'll help him pull through. Recalling his own agony, he felt sorry for her, and also felt that he was loved with a kind of violent passion. Hey baby, I'm thinking that if you want, I can cancel lunch with your parents. Yeah, please do that. Agnes goes into the other room and calls them, saying that they both have too much work to do today. Sitting there, Jeff suddenly remembers that when they were leaving Serge and Veronique's place the other day, Jeff and Agnes had invited them over to their place, and they were supposed to come over tonight. As Agnes walks back into the room, Jeff says, Hey, uh, while you're at it, could you maybe cancel with Serge and Veronique as well? Silence. I, I said, could you cancel dinner plans with Serge and Veronique for tonight as well? Again, silence. Cancel with who? He stares at her. Everything was falling apart. He made an effort to articulate, emphasizing each syllable. Serge and Veronique Schaeffer are friends who you invited for dinner tonight, with whom we had dinner on Thursday when all of this started. Serge works for the Environmental Commission. Veronique is studying languages at the Institute of Oriental Languages. They have a country house in Burgundy. We go there all the time. One time you even vandalized their radiators. They're our best friends, he finished, all in one breath. Agnes falls to her knees in front of him, crying. Baby, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know these people. So you're telling me that there's no Serge and there's no Veronique? No. So who were we with Thursday evening then? It was just you and me. We went to the movies. What movie? Pirel on the Mur. Where did we see it? Montparnasse. At this moment, everything crumbles around Jeff. What is he going to do? He wants to ask more questions, but he can't because he's scared of losing everything. Because no matter what he asks, there's a risk that she'll say it doesn't exist. But despite this, he takes a deep breath and collects himself and then asks... Am I an architect? Yes. Does Jerome exist? You just spoke on the phone about the psychiatrist. Yes, Dr. Kalenka. And you? You work in publishing, right? Yes. And your name is Agnes? Yes. And you just called my parents to cancel lunch plans for today? I called your mother, yeah. Because we were supposed to have lunch with them today, like we do every Sunday. She hesitates. With your mother, yes. Your father passed away last year. Everything is now spinning. He is sure that in the conversation they just had 10 minutes ago, she said, lunch with your parents. He gets up from the couch, walks over to the bedroom, turns to her and says, please call that therapist. He then goes into the bedroom, takes a couple of sleeping pills and tries to go to sleep, but he can't. Anxious, he got up and opened the door a little. She was sitting upright on the living room sofa, her eyes glued to the VCR in front of her. She turned her head at the creaking of the door, and he saw that she was crying. Please, he said, don't disappear. Not you. She only replied, no, go to sleep. He goes back to bed and lays down. A million thoughts are spinning in his head. How will he now adapt to the world? A world that seems to turn against him for every step he takes. Every thought he has runs the risk of deleting one of his loved ones or one of his memories or... He gives pause. He thinks there is always the possibility that Agnes is still the one who is sick. I mean, I know my dad is alive. I spoke to him just recently. It might just be that Agnes thinks that he's dead, but it doesn't really make sense because Jerome also 
Jeff sits up in bed. What if this isn't a prank? What if this is a deliberate plot to, to drive me to madness or, or to end my life? Yes, that, 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 that makes sense. Serge and Veronique, they probably just thought this was some kind of joke, but, but Jerome, he's actually in on it. Him and Agnes, they're probably having an affair behind my back and now they're trying to get rid of me. There's no Dr. Kalenka, what kind of a dumb name is that anyway? When Agnes came into the kitchen, she knew right away that I was talking to Jerome, but why? Why are they doing this? Well, that doesn't really matter right now anyway, does it? What matters now is that I need to get out of here and they can't know that I'm on to their plan. Jeff gets out of bed, dizzy from the sleeping pills and he starts putting on his clothes. Carefully, he cracks open the bedroom door and he sees Agnes still on the couch. She hasn't noticed him. He realizes that this is as good a chance as he's gonna get, and he goes for it. Jeff runs through the apartment, right by Agnes. She doesn't even have time to say anything before he bolts out of the door, down the stairs, and out on the street. He keeps running as fast as he can until he gets to a phone booth. He goes inside it, drops some coins in it, and tries to call his parents. The line is busy. He gets out of the phone booth and into a taxi. Bonjour, uh, to where would you like to go? He tells the driver what area he wants to go to and he gets taken there. When he gets closer, however, the taxi driver goes... Excuse me, what is the address? Jeff is just about to answer when he realizes that he can't remember. Uh, just drop me off here. Very well, sir. That will be 250 francs. Merci. He gets out of the taxi. Merci, monsieur. Have a nice day, sir. Merci. And he starts walking up and down the street he recognizes so well from his childhood, but he can't remember which house it is. Up and down the street he paces, furious. It's these fucking sleep meds, they're fucking with my brain. Fuck! He considers talking to the police, but he realizes quickly that Agnes and Jerome would just testify that he is obviously a nutcase, and he would get put away in an asylum for the rest of his life. No, he can't talk to the police. There's only one thing to do, he thinks to himself. I have to leave the country. He goes into a nearby cafe, borrows the phone and calls Agnes. Hello? Hey, I'm at my mother's place. Could you please come get me? You have an appointment with Dr. Kalenka today. Yes, I know. Please come pick me up and drive me there. Agnes is crying. Okay. I love you. He hangs up the phone. Fucking bitch. He waits in the window of the cafe until he sees Agnes' car drive past. When he does, he runs out of the cafe all the way back home, up the stairs into the apartment and he grabs his passport and credit cards. Back outside, he hops in another taxi Bonjour. and goes to the airport. Merci, monsieur. Have a nice trip. Adieu. When he gets inside, he learns there is a plane to Hong Kong leaving soon. One seat still free. He gets on the plane. Chapter 5 On the plane, Jeff sleeps. He wakes up when they land somewhere for a stopover. He roams around the airport for a while, waiting for the next plane to take off. On one of the walls in the airport, there is a world map and a bunch of clocks. Looking at it, he notices that Spain is missing, replaced only by a big blue sea. Chapter 6 Jeff arrives in Hong Kong, leaves the airport and gets a hotel room. Once there he takes a shower but he can't relax. He buys a shaving kit and shaves his face but leaves his mustache. He then goes outside and roams aimlessly. He finds out through another tourist that he is in Kowloon. And if he wants to go to Hong Kong City, there is a short public transport ferry ride. Jeff gets a ticket and gets on the ferry. After about 15 minutes, he gets off on the other side, but Jeff quite enjoyed that ferry ride, so he pays again and rides the ferry back. Once he's back, he does the same thing again. And then again.
this might just be his new life. For how could he go back at this point? I mean, even if his assumptions about Jerome and Agnes turned out to be incorrect, they couldn't go back to a normal life. Every time he or Agnes said anything, there would always be the looming risk of it not being true to the other's reality. Jeff keeps riding the ferry back and forth. For a fleeting moment, he considers how easy it would be to fall off the ferry and allow the big propeller to chop him up into little pieces. He keeps riding the ferry back and forth. He remembers the last phone call he had with Agnes. The memory of this last cry, doomed to remain unanswered, moved him to tears. Not daring to scream, he softly articulated, I love you, Agnes, I love you, I love only you. And it was really true, even more true because he'd detested her, because he'd shown himself to be unworthy of the trust that she'd never failed to show in him. She, at least, had never given in. He would have done anything to hold her in his arms again, hold her close, tell her again and again, it's you. Hear the same from her lips and never again stop believing her. Whatever came to pass, no matter how improbable it seemed, even if she held a gun to his head, at the very moment she was about to pull the trigger, when his brains would splatter all over his broken skull, he'd think, she loves me. I love her. That's the only thing that is real. Jeff silently cries as the ferry keeps going back and forth. Eventually, night comes and the ferry closes. Not sure of what to do, Jeff sits down on the pier. He sits there all night staring out onto the water until morning comes. He starts aimlessly walking around. He stumbles upon a fancier hotel than the one he lives in and he decides to have breakfast there. After breakfast, he also decides to get a room there instead. Once in his room, he goes to the bathroom and shaves his face again. He lays down on the bed, but then gets back up and shaves his face yet again. He again goes back to bed and this time he falls asleep, waking up at dawn. He goes down to the ferry and rides it back and forth. This might just be my new life. When the ferry closes, he wanders aimlessly. He stumbles upon an Australian man who strikes up a conversation with him. Ah, uh, g'day mate. Uh, so where are you from? Uh, France. Paris. France, okay, fancy, that's nice. How about you? Me? I live right here. Oh, in Hong Kong? Not right here, I live over in Macau. Ah. It's a simple boat ride away. That's what I'm here for. Well, uh, it's what I'm waiting for. Ferry ride, you know? I see. Oh mate, if you're here touristing, I recommend Macau. I love it, obviously. Uh, it's a bit more relaxed than Hong Kong, let's say. Jeff shrugs. I guess I'll go on the ferry too then. The man is happily surprised and they get on the ferry together. During the ride, the man goes into his room and Jeff into his and Jeff never sees the man again. When he arrives in Macau, Jeff checks into a shabby hotel. There he shaves his face and then sleeps for a while. When he wakes up, he goes wandering. After walking around for a while, no aim in sight, he realizes that he's lost. He sees a police officer, walks up to him and tries to explain that he's lost, but the policeman doesn't speak English. Jeff tries to repeat the name of his hotel, and the man looks confused, until suddenly he seems to understand what Jeff is saying. The officer points him in the right direction, but also takes out a matchbook, onto which he writes down the name of the hotel in Chinese calligraphy, so that Jeff can ask other people he meets for further direction. Jeff thanks the officer, and then starts walking again. After not too long, he's found his way back to the hotel. He goes up to the rooftop bar, orders a bottle of wine, drinks it all by himself, and then goes back to his room and falls asleep. Chapter 8 Two days passes in this exact same way. During the days, Jeff wanders around, drinks wine in the hotel, and has what he refers to as long naps. At times, in the far reaches of his numbed mind, menacing thoughts began to stir. 
concerning Agnes, his father, the relative proximity of Indonesia, the search for his whereabouts, and the future that awaited him. But he'd only have to shake his head, close his eyes for a while, or take a few sips of wine to dispel those images, which had become more and more lifeless. They'd been emptied of their substance, they'd soon become ghosts, as innocuous as a drowned beeper in the China Sea, only a disturbing but fleeting impression of deja vu. Chapter 9 On his third day in Macau, Jeff decides to go to the beach. To get there, there's a tourist bus that leaves every 30 minutes, but Jeff wants to walk, so he does. In the scorching sun, he wanders over a long bridge until he finally gets to the beach. Once he gets there, he goes for a short swim and then lies down on the sand right where the water meets land. Hey, did you see that? Jeff looks up. An American tourist is looking right at him. He looks around for a little bit and then back at the tourist. See what? The man laughs loudly. (laughs) No, nothing. Forget it. A couple of hours passes, Jeff just laying in the sand with his eyes closed. Eventually he gets up and starts walking back to his hotel. Along the way, a tourist bus stops to pick him up and this time he decides to get on it. He sits at the very back looking out through the window, not talking to anyone. He arrives at the hotel and walks up to the front desk, but notices that his keys are not hanging from the board of keys behind them where he would usually leave them. The man behind the reception desk smiles at him. The lady is upstairs. The lady? Yes, sir. Your wife? Didn't she like the beach? Jeff doesn't reply. He begins slowly making his way up the stairs towards his room. When he gets to his floor, he notices that his room door is left slightly ajar. He opens it, and on the bed lays Agnes reading a magazine. She hears him come in, but she doesn't look up. So did you end up getting it? What? You know, the etching. Did you end up getting it? He hesitates. No. Huh. The guy wouldn't budge on the price? She lights a cigarette. No, he wouldn't. I'm going to take a bath. Okay, I'll take one after you. Jeff walks in to the dark bathroom. It's too bad the tub is so small that I can't get in there with you. He looks down at the bathtub. She's right, they wouldn't fit two in there. He starts filling up the tub and as he does he notices several bottles of skin cream and hair products. Two toothbrushes. He takes out his shaving kit and then lowers himself into the warm water. Calmly, he covers his face with shaving cream. Carefully, while holding a mirror, he begins shaving off his beard. He then continues to shave off his mustache. From outside of the bathroom, he hears Agnes' voice. Hey, are we going back to the casinos tonight? If you'd like, he replies. Five minutes later, he was clean-shaven once more, and this thought provoked no other. It was simply a fact. He had done the only thing possible. Again, he shaved the place where his mustache had been, so closely that he thought he'd discovered tiny irregularities on this narrow strip of skin that he'd never noticed before. By the same token, he noticed no difference in skin tone, even though his face had been tanned by these last few days in the sun, but perhaps it was due to the shadowy light of the bathroom. Now he'd adequately located the position that would permit him to press the blade exactly perpendicular to his skin. 
He forced himself not to close his eyes when, under this weight, the skin finally gave way and opened. He increased the pressure, watched the blood flow. It looked more black than red, but that was also because of the light. There was no pain. He was surprised he didn't feel it yet, but as he gripped the tortoise shell handle, his fingers were trembling so much that he was obliged to continue his incision laterally. As he'd expected, the blade slid in much more easily. He curled up his lip to stop the blackish trickle. He was now feeling the pain, and realized that it would be risky to try and carry subtlety to its extreme, so he began to slice, not caring whether the gashes were neat. He clenched his teeth so he wouldn't cry out, especially when the blade reached his gums. Dark shreds like small strips of spoiled meat fell with a dull thud onto the mirror and then slowly slid down into the water, between his braced legs, rigid with pain, his feet pushing against the walls of the tub while he continued to maneuver in every direction, from top to bottom, from left to right. The hardest part was not to scream, to keep it up without screaming, without ever disturbing the stillness of the bathroom and bedroom where he could hear Agnes turning the pages of the magazine. She remained silent, merely turned the pages, perhaps at a slightly faster pace, as though she were growing tired of it, and meanwhile the racer had started in on the bone. He could no longer see. He could only imagine the vibrant color of his burning jaw, and something clear and bright in the blackish pulp of the severed nerves, surrounded by brilliant flashes, whirling in front of his eyes, which he thought he hadn't closed when he'd actually squeezed his lids shut, clenched his teeth, arched his feet, contracted every single muscle in order to bear the scorching pain and not black out until the work was done without further delay. His brain continued to function on its own, asking itself just how long it would continue to work if it would carry on even further before he lowered his arm to cut beyond the bone to the bottom of his throat filled with blood. And when he realized that he'd inevitably choke, that he could never end it in this way, he pulled out the razor, fearing that he'd have no more strength to bring it to his neck, but he succeeded. He was still conscious, even if his gestures were weak, if the titanic contraction of his entire body had receded from his arm and he sliced blindly, without feeling a thing, under his chin, from one ear to the other, his spirit alive until the last second, rising above the gurgle, the sudden jolt of his legs and stomach, alive and appeased by the certitude that now it was over, everything was back in place. At some point I read a review for the 1997 Harmony Korine film Gummo that called it something along the lines of the best horror film of the last decade. If you haven't seen Gummo, it's this strange and beautiful story about some people in a small Ohio town just dealing with life. Uh, but it lacks a lot of like traditional narrative and visual language. The reason that one line from that one review really stuck with me is because at the time of reading that review, I didn't consider Gamo a horror film. I thought of it as mostly a drama film. But Gamo did absolutely have the same effects on me as a lot of good horror films have had. And the more I thought about it, the more inclined I was to agree that Gamo is in fact a horror film. And you can probably see where I'm going with that anecdote in relation to the mustache, but I do want to say that I'm not trying to make some half-baked argument that anything is horror if you just think about it long enough. Like, yeah, Wally -E is horror because all of the, like, if someone interprets something as horror, I have no interest in saying that it isn't, but I'm also not saying that everything or anything is horror if you just think about it enough. Personally, I do think that the mustache is intended to be horror, however. Uh, maybe that doesn't come through enough in my interpretation of it, but if you read it, so much of the book is through the character's inner monologue, and he is really like a perfect horror protagonist. 
And really where this book shines, I think, is how well it puts you in the head of that main character. Jeff, as I decided to call him, essentially goes through all these different cycles of paranoia, sadness, conspiracy theories, euphoria, self-doubt, and all of it is reflected so well in just how the sentences are structured and the word choices. It's essentially written in a way, and this might sound a bit redundant because most books uh, probably do this, but uh, it feels like it's written in a way to really put you in the headspace of the main character. Like at times, especially during his like most manic episodes, I had to reread sentences several times over just to be able to kind of figure out what it is that he's saying because the sentences are just these long run-ons with no, you know, commas, no stops, they just go and they go from conclusion to conclusion and you kind of can't follow along and it really communicates so well just how he's feeling in that moment and then it'll switch to like completely rational on the next page. When it comes to my interpretation of the narrative I'm gonna keep it pretty short because I think one of the most compelling aspects of this book is its ambiguity. So in case that didn't come through in my retelling of it, it is never made clear in the book exactly what is going on here. And if you ask me, I feel like the only thing I can say for sure is that Agnes isn't pulling some sort of prank on him or conspiring to kill him together with Jerome. Other than that, everything's pretty much on the table as far as I'm concerned. Did he used to have a mustache? Is he or Agnes or the rest of the world suffering from delusions? I don't know. I really don't, and I have to imagine that for some people that feels like a cop-out, either on the author's part or on mine, uh, but I don't, and this book didn't like leave me feeling unsatisfied in the slightest. I have this bad habit, because I'm an insufferable person, uh, that when I watch a movie, uh, I'll just pause it in the middle of a scene and I'll turn to whoever I'm watching it with and I'll go, okay, here's what's gonna happen. And I wouldn't say that my record is flawless, uh, but I have a pretty high success rate guessing uh, what's gonna happen next. Fucking chair started creaking. And with that said, I read this book together with my partner, and every time I stopped reading to interject my shitty little opinions, I was wrong. Every single time I was wrong. I tried, I thought I knew where the narrative was going, and every single time, it went in a completely different direction. Did he used to have a mustache? Was Agnes fucking with him? Were Serge and Veronique real? Is Spain a thing? Who's to say? Another detail that I just wanted to mention is that towards the end of the book, when he meets the police officer, who scribbles the name of the hotel in Chinese calligraphy on his matchbook, uh, I scanned that uh, those graphics from the book. I'll try to remember to get a close-up of this right here so you can uh, see it. And I translated this and it's not a hotel name, but instead it says, careful, soon it's over. And I just thought that was neat. To summarize, I thought this book was great. I loved it, I have a great time reading it. At times it's a little repetitive and hard to get through, but in the end it all just goes together so well and it just adds to the experience, and I think you should read it too. But that's about everything I have to say on the mustache right now. I wanna thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day. Uh, please subscribe and do all of those things. And don't worry, I'm sure my mustache will have time to grow back out in time for the next video. See ya.